I mean, the word utopia shows up in your work mm-hmm. in a number of places. I mean, usually when I hear the word utopia, it's somebody criticizing what I'm saying. Oh, yeah. well, that's utopia. It's uto- either it's utopianism or it's boomer nostalgia. And either one of them is apparently supposed to immediately disqualify whatever I'm saying. Utopianism's bad, right? We're not allowed to do that. Yeah, we give a lot of uh, respect and credit to people who discredit. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> you know. It's like you're seen as this great, it's a great <laughs> gift to be able to debunk or or um, destroy and say, oh, yeah, this isn't possible, right? Like you're a realist and we're getting back to what's real. If you're an artist, you have to shove that aside every once in a while. And if it gets too involved in your process, it's crippling. I mean, that's what we need. We have plenty of critics in the world telling us how everything is not going to work and how the world's going to end in ever, whatever many years, and they all fight over how bad it is. Crowded right? trade, as they say. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. So rather, the world needs more visions and more different kinds of visions, right? And so anyone that is dismissive, I think, of utopian ideas, just let them go, you know, and keep working. Yeah, because, I mean, we're trying to, you know, turn Team Human not just into a podcast but into a site that has links to things that people can do and experts and ideas. And so yeah. I'm sure, you know, for every uh, for every would-be activist uh, who's listening to this, there's three would-be artists. You know, whether they're, you know, I mean, I get the, we get the emails. They're DJs and musicians and, uh, uh, gosh, people who want to uh, start farmers markets and uh, they're great dancers or they love to cook and this is the thing that happens with activism is they think oh you know this is the serious work and if we don't do this like these kids are gonna die right Right? and it it, (laughs) there you go that's it it. you raise the stakes to the point where you can take no risks and activism gets really conservative and we just repeat these old patterns right because it worked that one time in 1964 so maybe if we do it again, but that's not how it works. It takes creativity. It takes innovation. The, but it's also what causes burnout in activists. And like, mm. how many burned out, bitter activists do you know? We don't need any more, right? That, that's also a crowded field. So, um, so what part of how that happens is they start separating their creativity and their work. So it's like, all right, five days a week, I'm in this organization. I'm trying to push this issue forward and pass HB 270, whatever. But finally, on the weekend, I get to do my DJ thing, right? And your life becomes bifurcated where you start to resent the work that you're supposed to be doing that helps people. And and tr- more escapism on the weekend with the creative work. And instead, what we're, we talk about at the center is bringing those two things together. Because that's what it takes to be a whole human being and not an activism machine that has some time off. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, that's this is... A- precisely the struggle that I've been experiencing lately. You know, I spent the last decade and a half justifying my previous work with scholarship and research. I did my my book on, here's a valid critique of corporate capitalism, here's the numbers that show that digital economy is not working in favor of people, and here's this and there's that. And it's like, ugh. And then finally, the facts don't really matter to anybody, as electoral politics will show. Who cares? Yeah. You're right. I'm right. I'm right. I'm yeah. right. Great. Well, even if you are right, people will ignore those facts. Right. right. Like try un- uh, arguing with your uncle at Thanksgiving about what's right, you know, or like what actually happened and see where it gets you. Use the truth and see where it gets you. Um, and, but this is an argument for the arts, right? Right. Like, we, we think of um, politics as being incredibly rational. And if I take these arguments and I put them together and, you know, as you probably do, have done in many books, right? We get to the end of the book and there's no other conclusion. This is the right way. And if we just repeat what we do in the book or give people the book, right, whether it's the Communist Manifesto or the Bible, and say, if you just read this book, you will understand the truth. Right. Where has that gotten us? Right, and then they don't understand, and we go, oh, well, they must be illiterate then. Yeah, yeah, illiterate. and then we, we just educate them all. the people that were trying to <laughs> get involved, right? Right. And, and write them all off as idiots. Or the arts is not about, like, just the truth. We need the truth, right? We ha- it has to be grounded in something real. I'm not saying we create fantasy worlds. But the arts is the world of affect and emotion. And that's really what's motivating people, right? Whether they're Trump supporters and, and their their anger has been stirred up or the dreams of like Obama uh, 
at any point, right? Um, those are not rational. Like the reason that you feel disdain for Trump or like Trump is, it's not, I mean, you can, you can argue why it's true, but in the end, it's a gut feeling. And those kinds of feelings are what comes out in theater. What, what, it's the indescribable thing when you're looking at a painting about like, why do you feel this way? You can't describe it because it's not rational. It's affective and emotional. And so when we bring the sort of truth and the, uh, the, the structure of activism with that emotional, affective experience of art, that's when it actually becomes really effective. Right. And you know, thinking back on something like Occupy, that, the, it was the, the Alan Capra-like happening of Occupy, which really is what captivated people almost more than the education on how the economy was working or not. Yeah, it's not like uh, people went down there because they're like, you know what I would like is a university course on economics, but I just want to sit outside. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like that's not that's not the motivation. You know, they're motivated by a dream again. Right. And so so we we, we have to bring these together for activism to be effective. And that's what like I've spent the last whatever, eight, nine, maybe 10 years studying is how activism and art fit together and the strengths of art. And, and art has plenty of weaknesses too, um, but, but figuring out how they can work together really effectively and see it work, to put it to, to the test and see it work, you know, it has been, uh, a, I don't know, I feel really lucky to have been able to do that and then also share those things with activists around the world. Well, we feel lucky that you <laughs> joined Team Human and, <laughs> and, and shared it with us, you know, so thank you. Thanks for joining Team Human. You're welcome. I am glad to be here. As you know, like, I'm of a certain age. <laughs> Usually you say that when you're older, but I'm slightly younger, right? Where I, your books, your early books were really influential. And, there, and like Steve Duncombe, who I work with now also, like, had written a few books by the time I came across them. So there was a lot of, like, uh, uh, groundwork and foundation that was laid that I could kind of combine and build on. And so I'm glad to be here in that way. Well, thank you. I've, I've learned a lot from you too, you know, and, and sometimes it takes the, the next generation to process and then bring things to a new level. So now that you fed that back to me, I feel, uh, I don't know, invigorated, ready to, to make this whole journey a lot more fun um, than, than maybe it's been lately. You know, for however dark it gets, it just means we have to find more, uh, more ingenious ways to uh, break people's minds open. Yeah, that's like the creative challenge, you know? 